So democracy is dead. Many people may feel that. I'm going to talk about two historical patterns that explain why democracy is indeed disappearing from our world. So yes, it's not worth voting anymore. You won't get what you want. Even if your party gets into power, it won't implement the policies that you voted for. People talk of the uniparty or the regime. It doesn't matter which side gets in, the policies end up being the same, whoever is in power. And why is that? Well, there are several ways of looking at it. One is that politicians, or at least the majority of them, are just corrupt. They're interested in power and in the perks of their positions. They have more in common with each other than with the people who elect them. Being a politician is tough, very competitive and hard work once you get there. It takes a special kind of person, determined, ruthless, strong self-belief, lust for power, things like that. Even if they start off with great ideals, they're soon inducted into the machine and they learn to play the game of politics, not rock the boat, but play along to get their share of honours and rewards. If they try to strike out with some kind of reforming zeal, they're probably not going to get support from their colleagues and they'll be neutralised. Politics has been described as the art of the possible, focusing not on ideals but on what's actually achievable. So there is a lot of compromise. And remember I'm talking here about democratic politics, the kind of politics where people get elected to some kind of parliament, assembly or congress and then debate, negotiate and vote to make laws and policies. The kind of politics we've been used to in most Western countries for at least the last 80 years and with interruptions in some places for perhaps two or three centuries overall. So yes, the reason why there may be a uniparty, why politicians seem to be all the same and voting seems to make little difference, is that Politicians socialise and cooperate with each other and come to cosy mutual understandings and form a group view of the direction in which their society should be heading, regardless of which side of the political aisle they are supposed to be on. A second possibility involves the fact that politicians don't rule the country directly, but rule through the civil service and the civil service consists of career administrators who spend a working lifetime inside government institutions and have a much better understanding of them than do the politicians who are put in charge of them typically for a few years at most. The TV programme Yes Minister satirised the way the civil servants can pull the wool over the eyes of naive politicians if they don't like what the minister is doing, they just stall and delay and come up with excuses until there is a reshuffle and someone else comes along. So the civil service has an organisational agenda and when politicians are sent to administer it, the civil servants carefully feed them information and suggestions to bring them round to the civil services plans and worldview. And if a politician is particularly stubborn and doesn't fall for it, they just stonewall and raise all sorts of difficulties until someone more malleable comes along. The deal is that the civil service will efficiently do what it has a lot of experience at doing, and in return for not interfering, the politician can get all the credit. This leads on to the concept of the deep state, the deep state is more than just well-entrenched senior civil servants thinking they run the show. The deep state hypothesis supposes that there is an alliance between groups like civil servants, intelligence services, the military, financial institutions, corporations, owners of the media, the royal family, international bodies and think tanks, and existing and former politicians who have shown their allegiance to the deep state. These people have real practical power and the hypothesis is that they form a clandestine government that runs the country. 
According to Peter Hennessy's book, The Hidden Wiring, someone once said to Herbert Asquith, who was Britain's Prime Minister before the First World War, that it must be nice to have so much power. And he replied, power? You think you're going to get it, but you never do. So even as Prime Minister, he didn't feel he had power. And this is perhaps because it's the deep state that is really in control. And you can see how this is likely to happen. These networks of people in important positions are going to build up behind the scenes and they can have much greater continuity of purpose than the elected politicians who suddenly find themselves voted into office and are always insecure and worried about being voted out again. And even bigger than the deep state, there is the possibility of some shadowy international cabal that is devoted to social engineering and is trying to take humanity towards a utopian world designed by the cabal in which people will not be asked for their opinions but will be expected to behave in ways that the cabal has decided is for the best. The World Economic Forum has boasted about its Young Leaders Programme and the fact that graduates of this programme are found in the cabinets of major Western countries. So it repenetrates the cabinets. Some people might well see this as suggesting that such politicians are implementing the agenda of the World Economic Forum, which isn't answerable to any electorate, rather than doing what their voters want. Or if not the World Economic Forum, it might be the United Nations or the Freemasons or the central banks or some even more secret organisation that we don't even know exists. And then there is a suspicion that whoever is controlling politicians, whether it is the deep state or this international cabal or perhaps foreign governments, is doing it through blackmail. Politicians are likely to have things in their browser history or in their personal lives that they don't want revealed, whether sexual or money related. And... If they don't start off with such secrets, they can probably be honey-trapped into them by enticing them into affairs or giving them financial favours that don't get declared to the tax authorities. And blackmail gives whoever is running things behind the scenes real hard control over the politicians who face a prospect, if they resist, not just of uh, losing their seat on the gravy train, but the ruin of their reputations, financial ruin and possibly jail. It means that voters, without that kind of leverage, have no chance of getting politicians to represent their interests. And politicians can be made to support things that go against their own instincts and wishes, as well as against the instincts and wishes of their electorate and their country. And in his book, How Democracies Perish, Jean-Francois Revel says that democracy is particularly vulnerable to being subverted from within because by its nature it tolerates opposition and dissent. If you criticise an authoritarian regime, the regime will just crack down on you. But criticism is a natural part of democracy and it ends up that the people defending democracy are seen as the traditionalists, the reactionaries, the baddies, while the people attacking democracy are seen as the ones with new ideas, the progressives, the good guys. So if there is some secretive movement trying to grab power, then democracy makes it very easy for them to do so. Recently, we've seen the Emir of Kuwait suspend parliamentary democracy because of a perception that it was being subverted by some elements to the detriment of the national interest. And moving away from the deep conspiracy theory view of life, another reason why we get the feeling politicians are all alike and voting doesn't change anything is that political parties tend to converge on the centre in order to get the most votes. 
Let's imagine political opinions as being on a spectrum from left to right. And suppose we start off with two parties, one on the left and one on the right, which we'll show as red and blue. All the people whose opinions fall in the red area are closer to the red party and will vote for red. And all those whose opinions fall in the blue area are closer to the blue party and will vote blue. Now suppose the red party shifts its political position to the right. It's going to pick up a bigger share of the vote. And it makes sense for the red party to shift its political position right up to that of the blue party to maximise its share of the vote. And the same, of course, applies to the blue party. So it's been shifting left. And you'll probably get the two parties ending up in the middle. Anyway, the two parties will end right next to each other, so you can hardly tell them apart. What if you have three parties? Well, the leftmost party will move just to the left of the middle one, and the rightmost party will move just to the right of the middle one. And you notice that not only do the parties end up right next to each other again, but the middle party gets squeezed out and you end up with basically a binary choice. So these are possible reasons why democracy has gone to the bad. Politicians are part of a corrupt, cosy club. Real power lies with unelected bureaucrats and cabals. Vote-seeking causes parties to converge on the same policies. And which is the correct one? Well, basically all of the above. We don't need to worry about the details. The point is that democracy, which is supposed to be government by the people, contains within itself pathologies, problems that eventually and inexorably undermine it so that it ends up being bad government, not serving the will of the people. And the idea that democracy is self-destructive was understood long ago by the ancient Greeks who saw it as part of a broader pattern affecting the evolution of government and politics. So according to Plato, it looks like this. A young society is ruled by its best citizens. In Greek, aristos means best and krasi means rule. So we start with aristocracy, rule by the best. By aristocracy, we mean the nobles, the warriors, the heroes, the brave, the leaders. They're the ones who bring the society together, create order from chaos and lay down the society's fundamental institutions. In the case of American history, you might think of the founding fathers. In the case of British history, you might think of William the Conqueror and his knights. They are the risk takers, the ones with guts and determination, the ones who make things happen. They are the very best. But the paradox is that once they have created an orderly and peaceful society, their skills of bravery and organisation are no longer needed or relevant. Aristocracy leads on to what Plato calls timocracy, based on nobles vying for prestige. It comes from time, meaning honour or nobility. So it means rule by the nobles. And the point is that these are people who have the social status but are not necessarily the best in terms of character and ability. And what's more, the Timocrats are not focused on the good of society or on building a successful society, because that's already been done by the aristocrats. Instead, they are focused on their own selfish motives of trying to get for themselves the biggest share of the society's wealth, honours and political power. And Plato suggests that at this stage of evolution, there's a struggle between those who have high social status by being born into the nobility and those who gain wealth in their own lifetime through sheer determination and ability. The nobles try to hold on to the most important positions through their social status, while the wealthy are always trying to break into that social class. And out of this struggle, according to Plato, society moves on to the next stage, which is oligarchy, meaning rule by the few. In the struggle of timocracy, some people fall by the wayside, 
while others rise to the top. There are winners and losers. So power ends up in the hands of a few families who combine wealth with noble social status, most likely by intermarriage. Well, this arrangement looks increasingly unfair to the rest of society. And according to Plato, there is now a struggle between these wealthy families and the proletariat, the ordinary citizens who want a bigger say in the running of society and a bigger share of its wealth. Well, successive generations of the oligarchs give away more and more of their power and privileges in order to appease the far more numerous proletarians. Institutions of government evolve to give a bigger say to ordinary people and you end up with democracy, meaning literally rule by the mob. The mob tends to govern not by the rules, laws or abstract principles of rights and duties that might have been laid down by the society's founders, but simply by the power of the majority. The biggest and most aggressive faction wins. So laws that might have been put in place to protect the individual are likely to be ignored if that individual is out of step with what the majority wants and the individual will just be crushed. And in the situation of democracy, the struggle is between rich and poor. On the one hand, we have the capable, hardworking, successful people, the entrepreneurs or people with special skills who accumulate resources and make nice lifestyles for themselves. These are the rich. On the other hand, we have the people who don't have those drives and abilities. They take a job in the factory. They don't build factories and create jobs for others. They lack ambition or they're not gifted or they're lazy or they're just motivated by other things. These are the poor or relatively poor. And I'm not trying to condemn such people. That's just the way it is. I consider myself one of them. And the struggle here is between the rich who value property rights and freedom, which allow them to accumulate wealth, and the poor who value communal possessions and equality, which will transfer resources from the rich to themselves. That is Plato's view. So in democracy, where the majority rules, the mob rules, there is this struggle between the rich and poor over the rules for distributing society's resources. Well, this struggle leads the society into political and economic breakdown because the poor have the power of numbers and it stops being worthwhile to get rich. It stops being worthwhile to build factories and create jobs. And so there are no factories and no jobs. And out of this disorder, you get tyrants, strongmen, gangsters, basically, who are ruthless and don't care about either freedom or equality, either laws or fairness, but only might is right. And they're prepared to use force to bring back some order to society and make it function again, not necessarily function well, but at least limit crime and make people work for a living. So you can forget democracy and you can forget aristocracy and these other forms of government. You are now in the realm of tyranny. Well, that's Plato's vision of the evolution of government as a steady degradation from rational and just to mob rule than dictatorship. The Greek Polybius had a slightly different view, saying that this is actually a cycle leading eventually back to aristocracy as the most noble and self-sacrificing members of society overthrow tyranny and put something better in its place. He called his theory of government anacyclosis, and it looks like this. First, he says that society can be divided into the one, the figurehead, the few, which is the elite, and the many, which is everyone else, the common people. And governments differ according to which of these is in power. And then each kind of government can be either benign or malign, either just and liberating or arbitrary and oppressive. So benign rule by the one is kingship, implying a fair, wise ruler, while malign rule by the one is tyranny. Then aristocracy, rule of the best, is a benign form of rule by the few, 
while oligarchy, rule of rich and powerful families, is malign rule by the few. Democracy, in Polybius's scheme, is benign rule by the many. So he understands democracy to mean democracy before it gets corrupted, when the will of the voters really counts, and people are governing themselves in a true sense. And ochlocracy is the malign form of government by the many, with ochlos being a more explicit word for mob, as opposed to demos, which can just mean people. So Polybius sees societies as going through these forms of government, with rule by the one, then by the few, and then by the many, and evolving from benign to malign at each level. So tyranny causes the noblest members of society to rebel against it and restore benign rule under their own guidance. And after this has devolved into oligarchy, there is a revolution by the people resulting in democracy where everyone gets a vote. For Polybius, the process ends in autocracy. This is ruled by a strong man, a man of violence, who seizes power through his personality, charisma and personal following. Under autocracy, we get not the rule of law, but the rule of force. And this autocracy evolves into kingship, where the relationship between king and subjects is formalised and legitimised by the notion that the king exercises power, not just because he feels like it, but for the good of society. And so you have a cycle, anacyclosis. And we are here on the culmination of the cycle in malign rule by the many, where people have votes, but these votes are empty, and the world they get is increasingly one they don't want. Now, it might seem strange that Plato and Polybius see democracy as the most degraded form of government coming just before tyranny. We're usually taught that democracy is the highest form of government, the fairest and most just, one that gives the most freedom, as well as preventing the worst kinds of inequality. We're told of the need to spread democracy to the countries that don't have it. In his book, The End of History, Francis Fukuyama argued that countries everywhere are converting to democracy and not converting back. And this is in accordance with Hegel's theory that universal freedom or liberty is the goal and end state of history. According to Winston Churchill, while democracy is not perfect, it is the least worst option. As he put it, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. But Polybius might say, wrong. Government can be good or bad, whether it's by the one, the few or the many. You cannot say democracy is the best of a bad bunch, and you certainly can't say it is the natural final state, because this is a cycle that eventually moves past democracy and loops back to the beginning. In his book Theory of Economic Growth, Arthur Lewis says, Italy has a recorded history which stretches back 2,500 years and which includes experience of every constitutional form. It's not possible to pick out any one of the forms, say the democratic periods or the periods of monarchy or the periods of dictatorship, and say that Italy was always better governed under this form than under any other. The same applies to Greece, to Egypt, to India or to China, whose recorded histories are even longer. Good government demands a combination of wisdom in the rulers with the consent of the ruled, and this combination is not monopolised by monarchs, by democrats or by dictators. So, according to this, there is no evidence that democratic government is always good government. One internet meme refers to democracy as the tyranny of the majority, a term introduced by Alexis de Tocqueville in his study of the newly created United States. And another meme suggests that democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to eat for lunch. It's because of this that the founders of the American Constitution 
built-in checks and balances between the different branches of government and a system of individual rights that could not be infringed and that guaranteed all sorts of freedoms such as freedom of speech and freedom of religion. This was also that a government elected by the majority could not be used to suppress unpopular opinions and crush the people who hold those opinions. And this is why people say the US is not a democracy, it is a republic. And similarly, the UK is a constitutional monarchy, where as long ago as 1215, the nobility forced the king to accept Magna Carta, guaranteeing certain individual rights, and over the centuries, obliging the monarch to allow the people more and more say in the running of the country. So indeed, when we talk of democracy, there are issues of definition and the countries that we call democracies are not purely democratic and don't officially describe themselves as democracies. You could say that when a country has the word democratic in its title, like the Democratic Republic of the Congo or the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, it's usually a red flag that the country in question is a tyranny. But that apart, yes, there may be debates about what democracy even means, but I think most people would agree that they can tell a democracy when they see it. And when we look around the world today, it seems that the countries people would recognise as democratic tend to be the ones that are the nicer places to live. The Global State of Democracy Index scores countries in terms of their degree of democracy, with Sweden at the top on 89% and Yemen at the bottom on zero. And this chart plots the per capita income of each country against the Democracy Index. And there certainly seems to be a clear relationship between the amount of democracy and the economic prosperity of a country. The more democracy, the better off people are. So it would seem strange to suggest that democracy is making people unhappy, leading to social breakdown and eventual autocracy. But correlation is not causation. Arguably, most of the wealth of rich countries was built up in times when many of their citizens did not have the vote, especially women and the lower classes or those who didn't own land. Democracy was a kind of icing on the cake that became affordable once those countries had reached a certain level of prosperity. Some of today's rich but authoritarian countries are edging towards democracy as though that is a natural progression of a wealthy society. And the point is that in the countries that are nominally democratic, there is a feeling, which is hard to pin down, that democracy is increasingly a sham. And the perception that democracy has failed is a serious problem, because elections are not just about the mechanics of choosing a government. As described by Bruto and Harrison in their book Inside the Mind of a Voter, Voting is an emotional act, for some people a solemn duty. The outcome is not necessarily the most important aspect of it. The real value is in giving people a sense of participation, and that sense of participation bestows legitimacy on the government that comes out of the election, even for those whose party was unsuccessful. It's a ritual that brings a country together and makes people aware of their citizenship. When the act of voting is perceived to be hollow and meaningless, people don't just lose faith in politics, they lose faith in the whole social order. Their citizenship is cheapened or denied. And this feeling that democracy is a sham is related to the way governments no longer seem to serve their citizens. Surveillance is increasing. Politics is increasingly polarised and based on a winner-takes-all mentality. There is a growing gap between rich and poor, with the rich bribing governments to adopt policies that enhance their own wealth accumulation. 
there's an increasing disconnect between elites and their populations. The elites meet at places like the World Economic Forum and climate summits, or sign treaties on health migration and urban management that are devised by international bureaucrats. And their populations have no say in what is discussed or agreed or written in these treaties. In many Western countries, there is a growing feeling among the majority that their identity and way of life are under threat, while increasingly emboldened minorities call for replacement of democracy with authoritarian and theocratic institutions, and so on and so on. Now, everything I've said could be said to be anecdotal, but an explicit measure of whether governments serve their citizens is provided by the Worldwide Freedom Index calculated by Freedom House. This map of theirs indicates that freedom is decreasing around the world, with much more red than green, including reductions in freedom in the last couple of years in Canada, the UK, Germany and Scandinavia. The map tells us that indeed people are losing control over their governments or over the way they are ruled. And there is another theoretical reason why we should expect democracy to have to fail and be replaced, namely the Phoenix Principle. This is a principle that you have to destroy the old in order to create the new. And you have to destroy the old way of doing things because changes happening elsewhere in society mean that the old way is no longer optimal and may even be hampering human progress. But the old way of doing things never wants to go quietly. It tries to cling on, mostly because there are vested interests who benefit from the old way of doing things and want to keep it going. So the issue has to be forced by the old way of doing things actually failing and being destroyed by its own failure, clearing the way for people to develop a new way of doing things that is adapted to the new situation. All this applies to our current democratic institutions, which represent an old way of doing things that is no longer suited to the technologies we now have, but continues just because of inertia, just because it's what we've always done. You see, a few centuries ago, when the democratic institutions of Western countries first developed, there was no telephone, no internet, no internal combustion engine, not even decent roads. The only way for people to discuss things and come to agreement was to get them all together in one room. So if the king was going to listen to his people's opinions and give them a say in the running of the country, each district had to choose a representative, put him in a horse and cart and send him up to the capital city so he could get together in a debating chamber with all the other representatives and they could discuss what each district was thinking. But these days we don't need to do that. If the king wants to know what people are thinking, he can look on Facebook. If he wants to let them choose between different policies, he can broadcast his proposals to the nation and get people's feedback via a Twitter poll. The power of social media allows everyone to have a say and get involved in the debate. When there are decisions to be made, it's possible to consult people there and then. We no longer need to have an election every few years to choose a representative to go and speak on our behalf. Everything can be done directly and in real time. But despite that possibility, we are carrying on doing things in the old way, not taking advantage of the new technologies. So here we are with 21st century electronic telecommunications, and we're still relying on political institutions that originated in the Middle Ages, at a time when people were going around on horseback and communicating by quill pen and parchment. That is the power of social inertia. And that is why we have the Phoenix Principle. The old way won't change until it has become 
thoroughly discredited and destroyed. For a start, most people just carry on thinking in the old paradigm, taking it for granted, assuming that's just the natural way of things, forgetting why it developed that way. And then there are the vested interests that want to keep our political institutions the way they are now. You see, in the original way of doing things, you could expect each representative to stand up for the interests of his community or district. That was why he was chosen. And if he didn't do what was asked of him, he could expect to be roughed up when he got home, or at least dropped as that district's representative. But the system became corrupted and we ended up with the tail wagging the dog. We have political parties so that people are no longer just community representatives, but members of party machines. The party members collude with each other and take their orders from the party leader. So it is the party's agenda they answer to, not the wishes of their own district. And people's influence over their representative, their way of getting their views heard, has been reduced to choosing between a handful of parties that promise all sorts of things but don't necessarily deliver. And by being at the centre of things and mixing with all sorts of rich and powerful people, the representatives can use their position to gain fame and fortune. So what we have now are career politicians who may choose their party affiliation based more on opportunities for power than on deep personal principles. They are usually parachuted into constituencies, not really embedded in or drawn from the communities they're supposed to be representing. So these career politicians and the parties they serve have no incentive to modify the existing political institutions. Why would they get rid of voting and parliaments when that would mean the end of their livelihoods, the end of their access to power, the end of their raison d'etre? And those who might have an incentive to reform the system, i.e. the ordinary people, mostly don't care strongly enough, or they are brainwashed into thinking this is the way it has to be. So yes, if you feel democratic politics is failing, you are right. It is corrupted and well out of date. And if you feel that voting isn't going to help fix it, again, you are right. When votes don't matter, voting isn't going to help you make them matter again. If you are dreaming about a better future, and wanting to correct the problems you see facing society, you are going to need to think of other ways, meaning ways that are not democratic by today's terms, meaning ways that have nothing to do with existing political institutions. Not only is it useless voting for mainstream parties, but it is useless setting up new political parties. Because if those new parties come close to success, they will attract the same hacks and power seekers as the existing parties. They will end up with the same problems. They will betray their supporters like all the other parties. And for the same reasons, they will become corrupted because the corruption originates not in the parties, but in the system itself. So yes, you vote for old parties, you vote for new parties, you spoil your ballot paper, you don't vote at all, and nothing seems to change. You feel your prosperity diminishing. You feel your chances of future prosperity disappearing. You feel a stranger in a strange land. Your own government calls you the enemy. You see your society and your world changing in ways that you didn't choose, that you even voted against. You perceive that the opportunities enjoyed by previous generations are not there for you. And here I'm talking not just about the young, but also about the old who see the prospect of receiving a pension retreating into the future. Or you may be thriving today because it's always possible for those with drive and initiative to do well, whatever the social circumstances, whether it's a golden age or a dark age. 
even if the mainstream world no longer wants to hire you. You can still make a career online, for example. But you may still feel that the political system is broken for you, that it doesn't serve you, that the word democracy repels you and you want none of it. So you have two choices. You can do nothing and cry into your beer, trying to make your life as peaceful as possible, minimising the impacts, not thinking about it, hoping that you die before the worst comes to the worst. Or you can change your paradigm, realise that you're not looking for parties, for voting, for democracy, but for autocrats, and particularly autocrats who care nothing for democracy, nothing at all. Not woke autocrats, not politically correct autocrats, not autocrats who consult the people they're intending to govern, not autocrats who are trying to please the people or please other masters. No, the autocrats you are looking for are ones who act purely for their own motives. They exhibit what the cultural theorist Camille Paglia calls heroic masculinity. I'm talking about Genghis Khan, who massacred the population of Beijing. I'm talking about Alexander the Great, who killed his best friend in a drunken brawl. These people don't care if they offend someone. They don't care about anyone's issues. They don't care how special someone is. They don't care about anyone's victim narrative. If anyone claims to be oppressed, they will just think how pathetic, how pathetic to be oppressed. And the point is that such autocrats are coming anyway. That's anacyclosis. You can either get behind the ones that you support or get trampled by the ones you don't. And make no mistake, this is not an easy thing. Throughout history, people have crossed the Rubicon when they realise that persuasion, negotiation, being reasonable, being peaceful, isn't working for them. They have taken more direct routes and they have been imprisoned. They have been killed. They have not lived to see the world they fought for. Though I should say that moving beyond democracy, as I am talking about, doesn't have to involve violence. In the past, to take power, you needed to control the army. Today, you need to control the algorithm. So the battles fought by the coming autocrats may not be physical. But that said, let's face it, violence has been an accompaniment of political and social change throughout history. So it's hard to be optimistic that there won't be any. Whatever the case, it will be a struggle. You will have to stand up for yourself. It's not going to be easy like it was when you could put an X on a piece of paper every few years. You won't have peace of mind. It will require real effort, real risk. So if someone is appealing for your votes, forget about it. The leaders you seek are ones who are operating outside the existing political system and possibly in opposition to it. They don't need your votes because they are moving forward with their own resources and in their own way. They have a vision of the future and they are making it happen without asking anyone's permission. What you need to be concerned about is where you fit into their plans. And today's anacyclosis, this transition from democracy to autocracy in the governmental cycle, is occurring in conjunction with another major shift in human affairs. This is our shift into a new astrological age, the age of Aquarius. So when I was growing up, the age of Aquarius, the water carrier, seemed to be presented as an optimistic time of peace, love and harmony. It was a big theme in the musical Hair, which focused on sexual liberation and hippie values, and came out in 1967, the year of the so-called Summer of Love. A single release from the musical is about the dawning of the Age of Aquarius, and it conveys the feeling of an age based on humanism, when humans and human desires are the focus of society, as opposed to God and religion being the focus of society, 
which was the case in the age of Pisces that we are now moving out of. So yes, the age of Aquarius sounded great with its liberation and its humanism. But as I have learned more about it, I have come to understand that although these things are part of its meaning, astrologers don't necessarily see the age of Aquarius as the kind of optimistic happy time that I imagined. Now, you might be thinking, oh dear, this is just mumbo jumbo, isn't it? Astrology, horoscopes, all that kind of thing. It's just made up. It's just nonsense, surely. Well, maybe not. Maybe astrology isn't as ridiculous as it seems, and I'm going to explain why. First, we need to recognise that mood is a very important factor in human affairs. John Casty, who was originally a mathematician, wrote a book about mood where he showed that mood not only affects social behaviour, but seems to follow its own dynamic, driven by powerful currents that we don't really understand. Let me show you what he meant. So Casti observes that while mood is rather subjective, a way to measure it is through the stock market index. Whether people are buying shares or selling them off is an indication of investors' mood. It tells you whether they are optimistic about the future with an appetite for risk or whether they are expecting bad times and cautiously pulling in their horns. As the economist John Maynard Keynes observed, the behaviour of investors is not wholly rational. It depends on what he called animal spirits, meaning primitive emotions, gut feelings that you can't put into words, or in other words, mood. And Keynes presumably knew what he was talking about because he gambled all his life on the stock market. And since investors are part of society and absorb influences from society, their mood is likely to reflect the overall social mood. So the booms and busts of the stock market are like the mood swings of a manic depressive, going upwards during manic episodes and falling downwards during episodes of depression. And to illustrate this, Casti draws attention to this chart of the US stock market during the early 1960s. And he asks you to identify the date on the chart that corresponds to the assassination of President J.F. Kennedy. And what he wants you to notice is that it is not obvious. It turns out to be here, but nobody could really guess that just from looking at the chart. Now, you might think that a shocking event like the murder of the president would affect the national mood, but Casti's point is that it doesn't. JFK's assassination is just a blip on the stock market chart. It didn't affect the strong upward movement of stock prices that was going on before the assassination and continued afterwards. In other words, it didn't affect the national mood. Bear in mind that this is just a simple illustration so you can get his basic argument. The book as a whole gives a much fuller treatment of Casti's ideas. So yes, he's saying that mood is a powerful force gripping society and changing at its own tempo, influencing people's behaviour rather than itself being a simple reflection of actions and events. You see, there's a tendency to think that a cultural phenomenon like a popular film can affect the popular mood, making people more romantic or more adventurous or whatever. Or that a change of government bringing a new political party to power can affect the popular mood, making people feel like there is a new dawn and good things lie ahead. But Casti says it is the other way around. The film becomes popular because it tunes in to a national mood that already exists. That is why people like the sound of it and go to see it. And the new government wins the general election because the popular mood has already changed and the electorate wants a new kind of government. And as well as there being a social mood, we also have individual moods. We know from our own lives we can sometimes feel blue 
and other times more cheerful, and it's not always obvious why. If you've ever known someone who suffers from depression or been depressed yourself, you know that it doesn't seem to be in proportion to objective problems, but feels very organic, more to do with chemical imbalances in the brain than with the reality of the situation. It's no use telling a depressed person to take courage and things aren't really so bad. Once a person is in that mood, it has a grip on them that can't be shaken by logic and facts. So yes, there is something called mood and it is an important driver of behaviour. And it's not really a stretch to say that people's mood can vary throughout the year. Some people experience this very intensely with the winter blues, so-called SAD, seasonal affective disorder. And even normal people perhaps have a different mood in winter than they do in summertime. Not necessarily just happy versus depressed, but in things like how outgoing or inward looking we are, how family oriented we feel, how much energy we have and so on. And this is not just anecdotal. According to this Scientific American article, people's brains exhibit seasonal variations in dopamine, a chemical messenger involved in motivation, pleasure, movement and learning. Now, a foundational idea in astrology is that your personality is influenced by your sign of the zodiac, which corresponds basically to the time of year when you were born. So the zodiac consists of 12 signs from Aries to Pisces. And if you are Aries, you are born in spring. Cancer, you are born in summer. Libra, autumn. Capricorn, winter, and so on. Now, the time of year in which you are born will affect the time of year when you reach typical child development stages like focusing eyes, recognising faces, sitting up, first steps, first words and so on. And so the time of year when you were born will affect the different kinds of mood you are experiencing as you go through each of these stages. And it will also affect not only your own mood, but the prevailing social mood. And that in turn may affect your perceptions of the world and the world's reactions to you at each stage. And it's not unreasonable to suggest that because people born at different times of year experience different patterns of moods as they are growing up, both their own mood and society's mood, this may lead them to develop different attitudes and different ways of approaching the world. And this is what is captured by the astrological archetypes, i.e. the different personalities of each zodiac sign. To give a hypothetical example, just to illustrate the idea, suppose people are more lethargic in winter and more animated in summer. Then a baby that is reaching the stage of saying its first words in winter would likely get less feedback and encouragement than one that is saying its first words in summer. And this may mean that a baby that reaches that stage in winter learns to speak more sparingly and be more thoughtful about what it is saying. Whereas a baby reaching that stage in summer becomes talkative and sociable. So right there is a personality difference that could affect people all through their lives, resulting from the changing seasons and their influence on mood. And since babies born under the sign of Capricorn will tend to reach that stage through the winter, while babies born under the sign of Cancer will reach it during the summer, we might say Capricorns will end up more thoughtful and Cancer more social. And that's just one development stage. The same will be true of all these stages of child development, leading each zodiac sign to experience a unique pattern of mood influences during development and resulting in a rich set of personality types, one for each sign. And the time of year when you are born will also affect the pattern of changing seasons and resulting variations in your mother's mood 
while you are developing in the womb. And that could also leave an imprint on how your personality develops. So the idea that our zodiac sign affects our personality, which is a core principle of astrology, may not be so crazy. Maybe it results from definite mechanisms and known effects, including the influence of changing seasons on mood, the influence of mood on social behaviour, and the fact that child development follows a fairly standard sequence. Obviously, this is not a rigid thing so that people born under a given star sign all have identical personalities. It's just a broad tendency and perhaps one of multiple issues affecting personality development, along with, say, heredity and family circumstances. But still, it seems it is enough to be noticeable, or at least that's a strong enough possibility that we shouldn't dismiss astrological ideas out of hand. And for some books on this, there is The Theory of Celestial Influence by Rodney Collin about how various solar system rhythms affect the Earth and affect the development of human society on the Earth. And The Cosmic Clocks by Michel Gauquelin, which brings out the scientific evidence for these influences. Now, let's review where the idea of zodiac signs comes from. Here is the Sun and here is the Earth, and the Earth orbits around the Sun once every year. Now, far out there in the cosmos there are stars, and we perceive those stars as making patterns we call constellations. So here, for example, is the constellation of Orion, a set of stars said to resemble the body of a hunter. The stars aren't really connected in any way, they can be at very different distances from the Earth, but they just seem to form a pattern when viewed from our perspective. Because humans are good at making patterns of things and we see faces in the wallpaper and that kind of thing. Anyway, constellations are dotted all over the sky, but there is a set of 12 constellations that lie along the band of sky that the sun seems to move along as we move around it. And these constellations correspond to the signs of the zodiac. So we have Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo and the others that are off the screen, wrapping around in a circle. Now let's look at this diagrammatically in a plan view. So here is the Sun again and here is the Earth in its orbit round the Sun. Now one of the zodiac constellations is Aries, so let's put that here. So when the Earth is at this point of its orbit and we look towards the Sun, Aries seems to lie beyond the Sun. So we say the Sun is in Aries. Now we can't actually see the Sun being in Aries because the Sun is too bright and the stars don't come out in the daytime. But the constellation opposite Aries is Libra, so let's put that here. And as well as orbiting the Sun once a year, the Earth also rotates on its own axis once every 24 hours, bringing us day and night. So if we are at this spot on the Earth, so we're on the side facing the Sun and it's our daytime, then we can look out towards the Sun and say the Sun is in Aries, although as I've said the constellation is actually invisible during the day. Then as the Earth rotates we are carried round to be facing away from the Sun, so we can't see the Sun and now it's dark and we can see the much fainter stars. And as we look out we will see Libra. So this is how we know the Sun is in Aries because when we are facing away from the Sun we can see Libra which is opposite to Aries. Now suppose a month has gone by and the Earth has moved a twelfth of the way along its orbit to here. Now, now when we look towards the Sun, it will be in a different constellation, which happens to be Taurus. And we can know that because at midnight, when we're facing away from the Sun, we find ourselves looking at the constellation of Scorpio, and we know that Scorpio is opposite Taurus. And so it goes on. A month later, the Sun is in Gemini, which is opposite Sagittarius, then Cancer, opposite Capricorn, then Leo opposite Aquarius, 
then Virgo opposite Pisces and now next the Sun is in Libra and at night we can see Aries then Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius and finally Pisces and the stars are fixed they don't move so as the Earth moves around the Sun we see it being in each of these constellations in turn or moving through the constellations in a repeating pattern and the time of year you are born i.e. the part of the Earth's orbit where you are born determines which constellation or which sign of the zodiac the Sun is in at your birth so that is your basic zodiac sign also known as your Sun sign and we say sun sign because there's also the moon going around the earth so at the moment of your birth if we look towards the moon we will see it against a particular constellation or in a particular star sign in this example it's in the constellation of Leo so that would be your moon sign the moon goes around the earth roughly every 29 days so moon signs vary more quickly than sun signs and don't form a repeating annual pattern matched to the seasons of the year the way sun signs do. So yes, sun signs, segments of the year, changing seasons, changing moods, child development. These are the factors that may explain why astrology works and our personality is influenced by our birthday, by our zodiac sign. Now for your full horoscope astrologers want to know not just the time of year when you were born not just your sun sign but also the time of day you were born and where you were born. You see suppose you were born at this point on the earth when it happens to be here in its daily rotation around the centre of the earth. If you look straight outwards you will see a particular constellation let's say it is Virgo this direction is known as the medium coily or mid sky and all the other constellations will be in their corresponding positions around the zodiac. So next to Virgo is Libra and next to Libra is Scorpio and next to Scorpio is Sagittarius etc. Now this is the horizon only the part of the sky above the horizon is visible the part below the horizon is invisible and seen from the perspective of the earth the sky moves this way of course in reality the sky is fixed and it's the earth that is rotating that way but from our perspective it's the sky that's rotating this way so Sagittarius is moving from below to above the horizon so astrologers would say that someone born with the heavens in this configuration has Sagittarius rising and because the earth does a full rotation every day or equivalently the sky rotates completely once a day it moves by one zodiac sign every two hours because there are 12 zodiac signs and 12 times 2 equals 24 hours one day so someone born two hours earlier would have Scorpio rising and someone born two hours later would have Capricorn rising so what star sign is rising depends on the time of day at the place you are born. Now let's add the Sun back into this diagram and let's say that the Sun is in Virgo that means the Sun is halfway on its journey from horizon to horizon so this is noon midday and two hours earlier is 10 o'clock in the morning and that's when Scorpio is rising and two hours later is two o'clock in the afternoon and that's when Capricorn is rising so everyone born on this particular day has the same sun sign they are all Virgos but a person born at 10 a.m. has Scorpio rising a person born at noon has Sagittarius rising and a person born at 2 p.m. has Capricorn rising and so on for other times of day now in reality the Sun is also moving through the star signs but it takes a whole year to complete one revolution so it hardly moves from day to day and that is why I could say that everyone born on a given day has the same Sun sign the same zodiac sign the position of the Sun relative to the zodiac is fairly steady but the position of the zodiac relative to the earth is going round once every 24 hours 
If we put the two motions together, we see that the sun is slowly slipping backwards and a month later the sun will be in Libra. And now someone born at noon will have Capricorn rising, not Sagittarius rising. And I should say I have simplified things a bit because this diagram shows half the sky above the horizon and half below. But as we know, during the summer in the northern hemisphere, the days are longer than the nights, which means that more than half the zodiac is in daylight. And similarly, in winter, the days are shorter than the nights, so less than half the zodiac is in daylight. And astrologers take this kind of thing into account when they do your actual birth chart and calculate which sign is rising, etc. Though it's not important for the point I'm making, which is that the configuration of the star signs changes with the time of day. So anyway, at the moment you are born, the skies have a particular configuration with a particular sign rising, a particular sign in the mid sky, a particular sign setting and so on. And so astrologers divide the sky into 12 houses. The house that is just below the eastern horizon where stars are rising is the first house and the others are numbered two, three, four, etc. around to the twelfth house. So the zodiac sign that is in the first house or moving out of the first house is the one that is rising and the sign that is in the second house will be the next one to rise, the second one to rise and the sign in the third house will rise after that and so on. And for astrologers each house corresponds to a different aspect of your life and at the same time each zodiac sign has a different character so it's a question of which sign is in which house that defines the details of your life. For example the first house deals with the self, it is about you, your sense of identity, your character, your degree of determination. The second house deals with wealth, it's all about your money matters, the fourth house covers home and family life. The sixth house refers to health and so on. And the zodiac signs have attributes like warrior for Aries, meaning strength, courage, tackling challenges head on. Or nurturer for Cancer, meaning maternal or parental instinct and including protection and guidance. So if we take our example of this person who was born with Sagittarius rising, which means Sagittarius is in the first house, they have Capricorn in the second house, which is associated with wealth. Now Capricorn is associated with rulership as well as building and enterprise. So we might say this person has the attributes of someone who is likely to be successful in developing and running their own business. And this person has Taurus in the sixth house which corresponds to health, while Taurus suggests being steady and grounded in the rhythms of life. So we might say that this person is likely to have a robust constitution and enjoy steady health through life. And so on and so on. Now, in the case of sun signs, I said the idea that the zodiac sign is related to personality may not be as absurd as at first seems because the annual zodiac cycle may be telling you about seasonal changes in mood. But what about this idea of how the zodiac maps on to the astrological houses affecting your health and stuff like that? Isn't that really getting into the realms of mumbo jumbo? Well again, maybe not, because as well as seasonal changes in mood, we also have a daily biorhythm governed by hormones that are released by our body, causing us to be active in the day and feel sleepy at night, just to give the most obvious example. And so the time when we are born affects when we are pitched into this daily cycle. And it's not completely ridiculous to suggest that babies born in the middle of the night, say, are treated differently than those who are born in the middle of the day. The day babies may feel a higher energy level in the world around them and may get more stimulation in their first few hours. 
and their first impression of the world is one of sunshine and light and activity. It's possible that this could leave a lasting imprint that affects their whole attitude to life. Or it could be that what's important is the degree of match or mismatch between the body clock that has been driving them in the darkness of the womb and the actual clock of the world when they are born into it. Or it may be that some existing aspect of their bodily makeup influences the time when they stimulate their mother's body to start the birth process. So there could be a link between the timing of your birth and your personality for one or all of these reasons. The sun sign, where you are born in relation to the seasons, is the most important thing determining your character. But the time of day also maybe has an effect creating a ripple on this basic signal. And it's not just the time of day that matters, but the time of day interacts with the seasons of the year. And that interaction is what is captured by this idea of where the zodiac is in relation to the houses. So yes, these ideas of astrology are very far from an exact science and we are at best dealing with vague tendencies and influences. But they may be related to quite real things like annual and diurnal biorhythms and the predictive fortune telling aspect of astrology relates to the fact that we shape our own lives and make our own luck. So, for example, if someone has an adventurous and aggressive personality, we might predict that their fortune will be to pursue a military career, say. And now we talked about sun signs and I said you also have a moon sign, which is the zodiac sign the moon is in at your birth. The moon moves around the zodiac once a month and in astrological theory the moon's position has a meaning for your character and fortune. Again this seemingly fanciful idea might have a basis in reality. The idea that the moon can affect human behaviour has long been recognised in the belief that mental illnesses can be more acute during certain phases of the moon. My brother once worked in a mental hospital and he hadn't been there long when he observed that the patient seemed more agitated than usual. And one of the more experienced staff said to him, well, of course, it's a full moon. This is the origin of the term lunatic for the mentally ill, meaning affected by the moon, susceptible to lunar influences. But this belief has been investigated and seemingly disproven by science, for example with research showing that there is no significant correlation between the phase of the moon and the number of people being admitted to mental hospital. But the problem is that it's difficult to measure something like mood, jumpiness or agitation, and the number of people being admitted to hospital may not be a good measure of changes happening in individuals. So these statistical studies may not be getting at the heart of the phenomenon. And more sensitive research, which is reported in this BBC article, has suggested that there is a link. Two scientists have found that there can be an amazing regularity in people's sleep patterns where they sometimes sleep well and other times have terrible insomnia. And sleep disturbances can be associated with mental health crises. And these scientists have found a similar regularity in the mood switches of people with bipolar disorder who oscillate between depression and being manic. And the key point is that they have found the timings here correspond to the length of the lunar cycle. Although people's mood doesn't necessarily switch every month, when it does switch, it is most likely to occur at a particular point of the lunar cycle. And it seems the mechanism might be related somehow to the gravitational effects of the moon. This is because the effect is observed 
not just at full moon, but at full moon and new moon. It goes in line with the tides, which are also strongest when the moon is either full or new. So if we look at how tides occur, the moon's gravity decreases with distance. So if this is the Earth, the moon pulls more strongly on the closest part here than on parts further away. And so it heaps the Earth up on this side, especially the water in the ocean, which is much freer to move, but also the land to some extent. And on the other side of the Earth, the part furthest away from the moon, is not being pulled as much as nearer parts, and this causes it to heap up away from the moon. So you get a double hump, and as the Earth rotates, you get roughly two high tides a day. Now, the Sun also has a tidal effect on the Earth, so when the Moon is in line with the Sun and Earth, the Moon's effect adds to the Sun's effect, and tides are stronger. That happens at full moon when we can see the whole of the side of the moon facing the sun, and at new moon when we can't see any of the side of the moon facing the sun. On the other hand, when the moon is at right angles to the line between the sun and the earth, it's pulling against the sun and the tides are weaker. And since these mood changes in mental patients occur twice a month when the tides are also strongest, it seems they might involve a similar gravitational effect. It's probably felt by all of us and it's just more obvious in mental patients because their illness amplifies the mood swings. Now as this article says, even though humans are three quarters water, tidal forces on the human body would be absolutely tiny, so it's hard to believe they could have an effect. But it has been shown that such effects do operate in plants, where tiny changes in the amount of water flowing in and out of the plant cells are enough to produce observable changes in behaviour. And what's interesting is that because the moon is also moving, the length of the tidal cycle is not one day but slightly longer. 25 hours, and it turns out that the human body clock also has a natural rhythm of 25 hours, not 24 hours, when it is cut off from daylight. So maybe our bodies can feel tidal effects. But there could be alternative explanations, such as the deformation caused by the tides producing changes in the Earth's magnetic field, which in turn affects human physiology somehow. Overall, the jury is still out on these things, but the bottom line is, it does seem possible that the moon exerts some influence on human moods, which may in turn affect our development and our character. And astrologers are interested not only in the position of the moon, but also in the positions of the various planets in your birth chart. Again, this seems to be getting extremely fringy, but the other planets do have effects on the Earth's movements, which may in turn affect our daily, monthly or annual rhythms. After all, the planets beyond Saturn were discovered precisely because of their gravitational effects on the known inner planets. And this diagram shows the relative sizes of the gravitational wells of the planets. It's clear that Jupiter and Saturn are huge, and Mars and Venus, though much smaller, are closer to Earth and on either side of it. So perhaps we are sensitive to subtle changes in the Earth's movements as these gravitational forces swirl around the solar system. And astrologers attribute different characteristics to the planets, where at the simplest level Venus and Jupiter are believed to have a positive or beneficial influence whereas Mars and Saturn are believed to have a negative or malevolent influence. So, for example, if when you are born, Jupiter is in the sixth house, which is the house representing health, then that suggests you should have good health. And if Saturn is in the sixth house, then you may be likely to have poor health. The implication is that just as tiny effects due to the moon seem able to trigger mental health crises, 
So the other planets, whether through tidal or magnetic forces or some other kind of forces, may also affect moods, human development and ultimately life chances. Now I've been talking about all this to set out some of the background for the idea of astrological ages. So it is currently mid-May and if you are born in mid-May you are a Taurus and quite a late Taurus because a week or so from now we will be moving on to Gemini. In other words at this time of year the Sun is in Taurus and coming up to move into Gemini. But if we look at an astronomical app like this one we find that this is not the case. Far from being towards the end of Taurus the Sun is still in Aries and hasn't quite entered Taurus yet. And the reason for this is the so-called precession of the equinoxes. So here is the Sun and here is the Earth with its orbit round the Sun and the Earth also rotates on its own axis. Only the Earth's axis of rotation is actually tilted at an angle to its orbit like this. So if we look at this situation the Northern Hemisphere is tilted towards the Sun. It is basking in the sunlight and spends very little time in the shadow in the night part of the Earth. So this is midsummer the longest day, the summer solstice, around the 21st of June. And when the Earth is here, the Sun is in Cancer. It has Cancer behind it. Now let's look at the situation half a year later, when the Earth is on the opposite side of its orbit. Now the Northern Hemisphere is tilted away from the Sun. It gets little sunlight and spends a lot of time on the night side of the Earth. So this is midwinter, the shortest day, the winter solstice, around the 21st of December. And when the Earth is here, the Sun is in Capricorn. Now the issue is that the tilt of the Earth doesn't stay pointing always in the same direction. The angle of tilt remains the same, but the direction of tilt rotates in a circle, like this spinning gyroscope. For the Earth, this wobble or precession occurs very slowly, taking about 26,000 years to go round once. So let's look again at this situation where the Earth is at midsummer with the northern hemisphere tilted towards the Sun. And as we've said, the Sun is in Cancer. But over the next 13,000 years, the Earth precession will carry it round so that at this point on its orbit, it is tilting away from the Sun. So this will now be midwinter. And now it will be in midwinter that the Sun is in Cancer. So to put it another way, today at midwinter the Sun is in Capricorn, but in 13,000 years time at midwinter the Sun will be in Cancer, halfway round the zodiac. And since it takes 13,000 years to process through six signs, it takes about 2,160 years to process through one sign. And the procession goes backwards round the zodiac, so if the Sun is currently in Capricorn at midwinter, then after 2160 years it will be in Sagittarius at midwinter, and 2160 years after that it will be in Scorpio at midwinter, and so on. And the thing is that astrologers don't take account of the effects of precession. For astrologers, midsummer is always in Cancer and midwinter is always in Capricorn. They keep the zodiac signs in the same position relative to the seasons of the year. And that is exactly as it should be if we are suggesting that it is seasonal variations in mood that are somehow connected with the different characters of people born under different zodiac signs. But what this means of course is that in 13,000 years time astrologers will still be saying in midwinter that the Sun is in Capricorn and if you are born then you are a Capricorn. But if people get out their astronomy apps and check it they will find the Sun is actually in Cancer. And since astrology was first developed enough time has gone by that we've already slipped backwards by a whole sign due to precession. And that is why when we expect the Sun to be around the end of Taurus we find it is only in fact around the end of Aries. Now astrologers actually start the year not from midsummer or midwinter 
but from the spring equinox, which is when the Earth is here, halfway from midwinter to midsummer. Here the tilt is neither towards the sun nor away from the sun, so the night is neither shorter nor longer than the day, but exactly equal. And that is what equinox means, equal night. And there's an autumn equinox on the other side of the Earth's orbit between midsummer and midwinter. And when astrologers first fixed the zodiac relative to the year, the sun happened to be in Aries at the spring equinox. But around the time of Christ, 2000 years ago, the procession of the equinoxes had already caused a big enough shift that the spring equinox was occurring when the sun was in Pisces. And since then, of course, 2000 years has gone by and since precession moves the equinox back by one zodiac sign every 2160 years, we're getting to the point where the spring equinox will be occurring when the sun is in the sign before Pisces, which is Aquarius. So astrologers say that during the time when the spring equinox occurred with the sun in Aries, the world was in the age of Aries. Then it moved into the age of Pisces, with the spring equinox occurring when the sun was in Pisces. And now it is about to move into the age of Aquarius, with the spring equinox occurring while the sun is in Aquarius. So in terms of astrological ages, this is where we are. Now, the precise timing of the onset of the age of Aquarius is debatable. This is because although the zodiac and the year is theoretically divided into 12 equal signs, the constellations in the sky are of different sizes and not evenly spaced. For example, Pisces is very large while Aries is small and there is even some overlap between constellations. So there is a certain amount of arbitrariness in where we put the boundaries and therefore there is a certain amount of arbitrariness in precisely when we say the sun at the spring equinox has moved from one constellation to another. But that said, many astrologers tend to put the transition from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius round about now, or at least in the next hundred years or so. If we say the age of Pisces began exactly with the birth of Jesus or the incarnation of Christ, as some think, then 2160 years on takes us to the year 2160 or thereabouts. In that case, we won't be in the age of Aquarius until the middle of the next century. But others think that the age of Pisces began a little earlier, and so the age of Aquarius should be occurring sooner too. On the other hand, there are some who think that instead of dividing the zodiac into equal sized chunks for the purpose of calculating the beginnings and ends of ages, we should go by which constellation the spring equinox is actually in in the sky. And as we have seen, Pisces is a large constellation, so the equinox sun position will stay in Pisces for longer than the nominal 2160 years. And people who think this way calculate that the age of Aquarius won't begin for many more centuries, perhaps as late as the year 2700. But I don't think that really makes sense if we go with the idea that astrological effects are due to mood changes caused by the various rhythms affecting life on Earth, like day and night, changing seasons and the tides. The constellations are just optical illusions, not real things, and are just a convenient way of labelling the divisions of the sun's movements. It would seem unlikely that they have any effect on us in themselves. I wouldn't rule it out, but I'm more inclined to see the zodiac as divided into equal segments, and therefore the age of Aquarius as beginning by the mid-22nd century. And even though that may seem a long way off, it's still relevant to us because it seems that the transition from one age to the next is not going to be an abrupt thing, but there's a gradual shift from one world order to another. So even if we're not actually in the age of Aquarius yet, 
we should already be feeling a foreshadowing of its particular character. So what will the Age of Aquarius be like? Well, for start, we can go on the characteristics of the sign. The sign of Pisces is characterised as the mystic. It revolves around emotions and feelings. Its goal is finding inner peace, but it's also about changeability, chasing the feeling rather than arriving there and staying there. This gives an association with struggle, devotion and a quest for novelty, innovation. And so we see that the age of Pisces, the last 2000 years, was an age of religions representing that Piscean spiritual quest and urge for higher awareness. We can think immediately of the spread of Christianity, Buddhism and Islam, also possibly Judaism, which took on new, more philosophical forms after the Roman destruction of the temple and the Jewish diaspora. And more recently, science, which grew out of things like alchemy and was a new kind of religion, a new kind of mystical quest into nature's secrets. Even the atheist Stephen Hawking described the goal of science as to know the mind of God. And the Piscean Age was a restless one of rapid, transformative invention and discovery, crossing the oceans, building machines and reaching for the moon. And before the age of Pisces was the age of Aries. As we've seen, Aries is characterised as the warrior. It is about strength, courage and dealing with challenges head on. As the first sign associated with spring, it also involves renewal and initiation. So it's perhaps not surprising that the age of Aries was a period of imperialism above all, as Altawil and Squitieri discuss in their book revolutionising a world. Although empire also existed in the age of Pisces, in the age of Aries they were numerous and continuous, growing and shrinking at each other's expense in a perennial battle for territory and population. War and conquest were a way of life, as we expect for the sign of the warrior. This was also a period of a beginning, the other thing we associate with the sign of Aries, in that it laid down the fundamental social institutions that not only serve us today, but may retain their importance for a multi-age cycle of existence thousands of years into the future. I'm talking about things like governments and government bureaucracies, markets, money, education, mass literacy and multi-ethnic, multicultural societies. So if the Age of Aries had Aryan qualities of war and initiation, while the Age of Pisces had Piscean qualities of religion and deep inquiry, what are the qualities of Aquarius? Well, Aquarius is characterised as the maverick. It is about opening the mind and understanding the world in a new way. It is about constant thought or thinking and wisdom. And it is focused not just on learning, but also on teaching. Aquarius tends to have an impact on the world, but it's not necessarily a happy sign or at peace in itself. Well, there are some seemingly positive things here, thinking, wisdom, opening the mind, new ways of understanding, teaching the world. These are the things that lead to that hippie-like view of the age of Aquarius, when thought will be free, open minds, liberation, humanitarianism, teaching the world, changing the world, improving the world. It sounds wonderful, but there is trouble in paradise. Note the emphasis on the world. Whereas the Piscean urge was for understanding the cosmos, knowing the mind of God, getting at deep mysteries and achieving personal insight and enlightenment, the Aquarian Age is concerned with the secular, everyday world, the world of human behaviour. So we are in the realm of social and political ideologies. And the Aquarian instinct for teaching and having an impact means that these ideologies are not going to leave you alone. The Aquarian ideologies are going to come after you. They are going to teach you how to think and behave. 
And it seems we can see the symptoms of these Aquarian tendencies already emerging in our world. Western countries are increasingly secular and social movements are very much about liberation, particularly sexual liberation and the liberation of minorities. Rather than paying attention to some spiritual, mystical, higher authority, as in the Piscean Age, the emphasis is on human needs and desires, finding yourself, freeing yourself, being yourself, doing what you want. And the focus is not only on reshaping the human world, but also on caring for the physical world via environmentalism. And at the same time, these movements are dogmatic and didactic. They're not optional. They embody the Aquarian urge to teach you to tell you how to live. And while they preach caring ideas like fairness, equality, freedom, it's not in a happy and joyful way, but in a way that many, especially those who disagree with the dominant emphasis, find uncomfortable and even see as leading to a world that is unfair, unequal and unfree. And if we look around the world, we see in China that a large part of the human race is already under such an Aquarian, secular, didactic social system based on humanitarian ideals, but deficient in freedom of conscience. Now, you might say, what about Islam, including Islamic radicalism, which is on the rise around the world and in Western societies, even calling for Western social institutions to be replaced by Sharia law, religious law. Surely that is not secularism, but the opposite, religion, a supposedly Piscean characteristic. But notice how inworldly this form of Islam is, how political it is. Like other movements of today that are concerned about climate, resources or social justice, it believes it has a better understanding of how society should be organised and wants to teach or tell the world what to do. And we need to appreciate that it's not really correct to see today's Islam as a throwback to the Middle Ages, because in fact medieval Islam was a conduit of the Piscean inquiry into the workings of the cosmos and gave the world alchemy, arithmetic, algebra, algorithms and much more. And it also gave us Ibn Khaldun, one of the founders of theoretical history. I've discussed all this in another video, but modern political Islam must be understood as a phenomenon in its own right, and it has a good deal of the Aquarian change the world, teach the world mentality about it. Now, we can understand more about the Aquarian age using other ideas of astrology. To start with, we can use the idea of the 12 houses, which cover different aspects of life. So we have Aquarius in the first house, which is the house of the self and of one's basic identity, character and outlook. So Aquarius has the primary role governing the spirit of the age, as we have been discussing. Then after Aquarius comes Pisces, which is now in the second house, governing wealth and prosperity or economic matters. Next is Aries in the third house, governing sharing or social interaction. Taurus in the fourth house, governing home and family. And so on, all the way round to Capricorn in the twelfth house, which governs issues to do with secrecy, the occult, what is hidden. As in an individual horoscope, the sign in each house can tell us something about how the affairs connected with that house will pan out in the Aquarian age. Another thing we can take into account is that the signs are each defined by a pair of attributes. First, the traditional elements they embody, which can be fire, earth, air or water. And second, their quality, which can be cardinal, fixed or mutable. Taking the qualities, the cardinal signs are the ones that start at the key turning points of the year. Aries at the spring equinox, Cancer at midsummer, Libra at the autumn equinox and Capricorn at midwinter. The fixed signs are the ones that follow each of these, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio and Aquarius. 
and the mutable signs of the final four, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius and Pisces. And the idea is that the cardinal signs exhibit dominance, the fixed signs exhibit stability and the mutable signs exhibit instability. Then for the elements, the fire signs are Aries, Leo and Sagittarius. The earth signs are Taurus, Virgo and Capricorn. The air signs are Gemini, Libra and Aquarius. And the water signs are Cancer, Scorpio and Pisces. And here the idea is that the fire signs are burning with energy and enthusiasm. The earth signs are down to earth, practical and prudent. The air signs have their head in the clouds and are intellectual and talkative. And the water signs are emotionally deep and sensitive. And each sign is a unique combination of quality and element. For example, Aries, being cardinal fire, is forceful and energetic, so driving things forward. Cancer, being cardinal water, is forceful, or perhaps better, a leader, but also sensitive, so is seen as a parental nurturing sign. Libra, being cardinal air, is forceful in the world of ideas, and so on. And one last astrological idea that may help us is the fact that each sign is associated with a particular planet, as shown in this chart. So Aries, for example, is associated with Mars, who is, of course, the god of war, and Aries is the warrior sign. And we see that Pisces is associated with Jupiter, while Aquarius is associated with Saturn. Now, before we investigate what these things can tell us about the age of Aquarius, about the world that lies ahead for us and for our children and grandchildren and many generations to come, it's worth pausing for a moment to ask whether any of this is meaningful. In the case of personal astrology, I suggested there could be a genuine reason why it works in terms of the interaction between biorhythms and natural cycles. But with astrological ages, we're talking about a 26,000 year cycle, much longer than the human lifetime, much longer than any biorhythms. It's hard to see how something as esoteric and slowly changing as where the equinox occurs could affect moods and social behaviour the same way that day and night or the annual seasons do. Well, yes, there is no doubt that we are in even higher realms of speculation here. But one thing is that the Earth's orbit is not perfectly circular. And at the moment, the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere occurs when the Earth is closest to the sun. But when the precession of the equinoxes causes the solstice to move round to be in Capricorn, the northern summer will be when the Earth is furthest from the sun, suggesting cooler summers and warmer winters, or a decrease in seasonal extremes. And perhaps this could affect social mood. The precession might also affect the tidal interactions of sun and moon, and also the interactions between the Earth and other planets. Even then, one might say, well, there could be a slight effect due to the difference between one side of the orbit and the other, but it's hard to see how this could result in a fine division into 12 distinct ages, each with different characteristics. And even if we do accept that there might be some effect like that, that could cause changes in social behaviour, it seems a stretch that the characters of the ages around the 26,000 year cycle should follow exactly the same pattern as the changes in personality type around the cycle of the year. But perhaps this has something to do with the time of year when people are most likely to be born. As shown in this chart of long-term averages for England and Wales, the number of births varies over the year. So there is an excess of Libra and a small deficit of Aries, for example. What if the precession of the equinoxes influenced the seasons in such a way that altered this pattern, reducing the number of Libras and increasing the preponderance of some other signs? This would imply a change in the preponderance of different personality types in the population, and that could in turn change the overall character of society. 
But still, even if we accept that possibility, how would astrologers know that it actually works that way? Because so far as we know, people have only been studying these things for a few thousand years at most, which is not enough time to check even one 26,000 year cycle, let alone to check several such cycles and verify our results. Well, my view here is that we should perhaps think of it in the same way as dowsing. Dowsing rods are not really instruments like a voltmeter or that kind of thing. If dowsing works, it is because the rods somehow pick up and amplify minute movements of your body. It's really you, your intuition, some delicate sensitivity of your body that picks up the signals of the water you are looking for, not the dowsing rods. But the dowsing rods are necessary to convert those subconscious signals into something we can perceive consciously. Some work in neuroscience suggests our conscious self is only half of our brain and we also have a subconscious half that sees patterns and can talk about them to our conscious self. When a fortune teller looks into a crystal ball they're not seeing scenes of the future like watching a television but the way the light reflects from the impurities in the crystal conjures up images in their mind and those images are perhaps there subconsciously all along as they contemplate whatever question they're trying to answer. And the light reflections in the crystal ball just provide a way to awaken those subconscious perceptions and bring them to consciousness. Or when somebody is reading tea leaves to tell someone else's fortune. Again, the fortune teller perhaps uses their own intuition and understanding of the person in front of them to make their predictions and give their advice. Um, the tea leaves just provide a tool for thought, a way for them to bring out what is already within them. And what I'm suggesting then is that astrological ideas about the age of Aquarius provide a focus for us to bring out an understanding that we already have about the way our society is heading and about the new world order that certain people and agencies are preparing for us. The astrology helps us say out loud thoughts that we have developed by conventional observation and reflection, but maybe not realised it or brought to the surface. Or maybe there is something in the ideas of astrology and society really is governed by the stars. So with all that in mind, what can we say about the characteristics of the Aquarian age? Well, firstly, Aquarius is ruled by Saturn and Saturn is a malefic planet, one that exerts a bad or negative influence. This contrasts with Pisces, which is ruled by Jupiter, a benefic or good planet. So the Piscean Age had a positive overall vibe, an optimistic feel to it, and so it was a time of wonderful achievements in art, literature, science, technology and discovery. But with the Aquarian Age being under the rule of Saturn, a planet that brings obstacles and misfortune, we should expect the Aquarian Age to have a negative pessimistic vibe it's not going to be a wonderful time of high achievement, but a time of struggle against difficulties, lack of forward movement, setbacks, low achievement, a time of gloom and stagnation. I would relate this to the death of democracy and the rise of technocracy, ruled by self-proclaimed managerial experts in how to govern society as in the communist or theocratic countries today, and also in the formerly free world, as it comes increasingly under the control of technocratic bureaucracies like the European Union and the United Nations, with their so-called agendas for the world, suppressing individual inventiveness and creativity in the name of protecting the environment or achieving equity, calling not for unchecked progress, but for self-limitation and sustainability. This contrast between the positive vibe of the Piscean Age and the negative vibe of the Aquarian Age is perhaps seen in their different visions of the future 
as expressed in science fiction. Firmly in the Piscean Age, we have Jules Verne and to some extent H.G. Wells with utopian views of the triumph of human ingenuity, typified by Wells's title, Men Like Gods, and the book The Angel of the Revolution by George Griffith about the invention of flying machines being used to overthrow the tyranny of Tsarism. But with the age of Aquarius looming on the horizon, science fiction moved towards dystopias like Brave New World and 1984, envisioning futures not freed from tyranny, but characterised by tyrannies more powerful than ever before. Now, Aquarius is a fixed sign and also an air sign. As a fixed sign, it implies stability and resistance to change. And as an air sign, it implies intelligence, being analytical and adaptable, thinking things through, playing with ideas, not just thinking, but rethinking. So the fixed attribute of Aquarius tends to make it dogmatic, whereas the air attribute makes it not dogmatic, but analytic, almost the opposite. This relates to Aquarius being the maverick. It's a bit schizophrenic. It's open to new ideas, but once it has got an idea in its sights, it can be quite impervious to other issues, becoming obsessed with working out its ideas and carrying them forward while being oblivious to people's feelings and other realities of life that mean the ideas may not be so great as they seem. So out of this we get mixed messages. The bad news, if you like, is that the Aquarian age is likely to be characterised by rigid ideologies such as communism, Islamism, environmentalism, which sound ever so well-meaning, making society more perfect in whatever way, but ultimately ignore the true needs of society and human nature. And the super bad news is that once these ideologies have got themselves installed, they will be stable and hard to dislodge. On the other hand, the good news, and it's not fantastic news, but it is better than nothing, is that there will be a constant stream of counter ideologies as the ordinary people of the Aquarian age continue to analyse the problems of their society and continue to propose new competing ideas. Air signs tend to have an element of self-doubt, so there will be this faint undercurrent questioning the social order. And by drawing on that Aquarian stability and persistence, the undercurrent of new Aquarian ideologies may succeed in overturning the older Aquarian ideologies and take their turn at controlling the direction of society. So in the Aquarian age, the elites will be doctrinaire, authoritarian and powerful, but the resistance will also be strong and determined, and sometimes successful in capturing the power structure, only to become the object of the new resistance. So if all you want is a quiet and peaceful life with minimum interference in your affairs, the age of Aquarius is going to be an uncomfortable time. But if you like ideological struggles, the battle of ideas, the fight against authority and or the crushing of dissent, then the age of Aquarius is going to give you everything you want. Now let's see what we can learn from the occupation of the houses in the age of Aquarius. And here I rely to a large degree on the analysis of the astrologer Robert Zoller, who died in 2020. So first, let's consider the 10th house, which in personal astrology covers things like the father figure, figures of authority, and for our purposes can be regarded as covering the issue of government. In the age of Aquarius, the 10th house will be occupied by Scorpio, now, Scorpio is a water sign and carries meanings of hidden depths, darkness and things to be feared, all of which suggests that in the age of Aquarius, government will be secretive and based on the rule of fear. This is reinforced by the fact that Scorpio is ruled by the planet Mars, which is a malefic planet, implying that government will be associated with tension and negative feelings. Beyond this, Scorpio is another fixed sign, 
implying stability. So the power elites are going to be heavily entrenched, capable of holding on to power for long periods. We can contrast this with the Piscean Age, when the 10th house was occupied by Sagittarius. This is ruled by the good planet Jupiter and is a mutable sign associated with exploration, newness and independence, so that in the Piscean Age governments were kaleidoscopic and somewhat vulnerable. We could add that Sagittarius as the ninth sign also draws in ideas from the ninth house, which covers, among other things, philosophy and ethics. So in the Piscean Age, there was a kind of connection between philosophy and government, which, according to Robert Zoller, meant that truth still mattered to the rulers in the Piscean Age, even if that was often honoured only in the breach and there was a good deal of hypocrisy involved. But in the Aquarian Age, this is no longer the case. Aquarian rulers won't even pretend that sticking to the truth is important to them or that truth has any relevance to how they govern. And so for this reason, Zola says that the power elites of the Aquarian age will make the elites of the age of Pisces look like amateurs, look like teddy bears. Now let's turn to the ninth house, which, as we've just said, covers the areas of ethics and philosophy. In the age of Aquarius, this will be occupied by Libra, the scales, bringing in ideas of fairness and the rule of law, which means not dealing with problems pragmatically and flexibly, but having a preference for abstract theory, for definite rules. So the ethics of the Aquarian age will be all about equality, which we seem to see already with the concept of DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, and in keeping with the Libran preference for definite rules, not only is fairness considered important, but this is not in an organic or emergent way, just by people being decent and considerate. Fairness is mandated, whether by company rules or government laws. It is inspired by theory, and it is specifically imposed on organisations and on society. And we need to remember that we're talking here about the ninth house, about the philosophy of the age, meaning that the rulers will preach a philosophy of fairness. They will preach equity as an ideology. But the actual nature of government, as we have just seen, will be based on fear and ruling with absolute power. So, as Zola says, in the age of Aquarius, we should expect the elites to deceive the people with Libran platitudes about equity, while in reality controlling society in a completely Machiavellian way. Now remember that Aquarius is about openness, humanism and being yourself. Air signs generally are associated with libertinism. So in the age of Aquarius people will look for and be granted that kind of freedom of expression. It will be fine to have pride and wear bondage gear in the street and be whoever you want to be. You can be liberated in that way, free in that way. You are free to indulge your fantasies and desires. But just don't pay attention to the elites. Just don't get political. Just don't question government power. You can do anything you want except claim the right to make the rules. That is off limits. Remember, Scorpio is in the 10th house, meaning that governments will be secretive, not for ordinary people to question. And related to this is that Pisces is in the second house, which covers the economic side of life. So Pisces is the mystical sign concerned with imagination, fantasy, things that aren't real. So it being in the second house, suggests that a key aspect of the Aquarian economy will be virtual experiences. People will escape into fantasy worlds to avoid the reality of their lack of political power and control. Robert Zoller argues that the Age of Aquarius will also be characterised by underground secret societies focused on building a new vision for society a non-Aquarian or post-Aquarian vision for society. 
This is because of the triple of earth signs in the fourth house, dealing with family, kinship and like-minded people. In the eighth house, dealing with transformation, including karma, regeneration and becoming. And in the twelfth house, dealing with privacy, seclusion and mystery. So the earth signs are practical, grounded and nurturing, which means that they are at odds with the ideological absolutist character of the Aquarian age. And from the fourth house, we get groups of like minded people from the eighth house, ideas of transformation and from the twelfth house, secrecy, all adding up to secret groups of people wanting to transform society towards one that is kinder and more grounded in reality. These secret societies will have to stay underground in the age of Aquarius and they will achieve their objective in the next astrological age, which is the age of Capricorn, an earth sign, which should be coming in about the year 4000. A couple of other points. Zola observes that the fourth house, dealing with family, also involves the theme of nurturing and hence education of the young. In the Piscean age, the fourth house was occupied by Gemini, which is an analytical intellectual air sign. So in the age of Pisces, places of education like schools, museums and universities were places of genuine learning, valuing real intellectual inquiry, real critical thinking. But in the coming Aquarian age, the fourth house is occupied by Taurus, a practical earth sign and also a fixed sign focusing on caution, staying grounded and maintaining the rhythms of life. This means that far from being hotbeds of thinking and inquiry, schools and universities in the Aquarian age will be devoted to raising good compliant citizens who will fit into their roles in society and be cautious in their thinking, not questioning too much, staying safe and just keeping society ticking over. The focus will be on educating youngsters for sustainability, for a society that doesn't change too much, for a society that is stable and therefore stagnant. Zola also points out that during the Aquarian age, Aries will be in the third house, which deals, among other things, with intelligence and self-development. So it can be regarded as associated with science and new forms of knowledge. Well, Aries is the warrior sign ruled by the planet Mars, the god of war. So Zola suggests that science in the age of Aquarius will be valued for its use in war or more abstractly for coercion, for exerting control over others. So we can expect that Aquarian science will develop things like artificial intelligence primarily for the benefit of surveillance and behavioural management, for governments to have better control of what their populations are thinking and doing. And I think this relates with what we are already seeing, how AI tends to reflect a particular partisan view of the world, one that aligns with the attitudes and agendas of governments and other hegemonic power structures like corporate media. So that is the world that is coming, a dreary Saturnian world of fake freedoms and repressive ideologically driven governments presiding over a mostly stagnant social order that is kept in a constant state of unease and an undercurrent of dissent. This is not a democratic world, it's not a world where you can expect your choices to matter but it is the world you're going to have to get used to, or if you have it in you, oppose and overcome. And to finish, Zola notes that because Aquarius is a human sign, we can expect that the Aquarian age will be particularly concerned with the human sciences, the social sciences. Remember that Pisces is concerned with mystical cosmic things, so the sciences of the Piscean Age dealt with stars, galaxies, the theory of relativity, subatomic matter and all the deepest secrets of nature. But Aquarius is secular and puts humans front and centre. 
giving the most importance to human needs and human interaction. So Aquarian science will naturally be about understanding humans and human behaviour. And it makes perfect sense that part of that will involve the new emerging science of theoretical history, which is about understanding historical patterns or about understanding the principles of human behaviour that cause societies to take on particular forms and to change in particular ways. It's about understanding why we have cities, what causes revolutions and things like that. And because, as we've just seen, the sciences of the Aquarian Age are likely to be valued for their use in war, coercion and social control, we can expect that the Aquarian power elites will not sponsor research in theoretical history just for the hell of it, just for the sake of intellectual curiosity. They will want to use their knowledge of historical patterns, in other words, the theories and models described in this book, as a tool of social control. The power elites will use this theoretical history to manipulate their populations, entrench their power and force society into their preferred ideological mode. So this information is in effect a manual for the authoritarian dogmatists who will dominate the coming age of Aquarius. But because of Aquarius's schizophrenic nature, meaning that there will be a countercurrent of counter ideologies quietly but doggedly criticising and undermining the Machiavellian Aquarian rulers, we can just as much say that this book, the information in it, is a manual for the resistance.